Bombs. <laughs> I put my touch in the <laughs> Feet and elbows and everything. Oh my gosh. Well, this is not my typical office setup because I'm not home. I'm traveling, but but hopefully this will work. That's okay. That's what life is all about. Yeah, right? absolutely. It's always about making, making things work with yep. what you have. That's right. <laughs> you, you nailed it. That's it. That's the lesson. <laughs> so this is a perfect example for it. Yes, right? absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. <laughs> so first of all, so thank you so much for like taking the time and, you know, you and Ajit and uh, Fission is like in my hug list and, you know, Aww. take me a month to like get to you with me. <laughs> You have good, you have good patience, good patience. Yeah, and congratulations on, on, you know, on being an awesome uh, part of, of making the light and the awesome pest and Thank ever you. coach. Uh, I love your video on the, on the, hang on, my friend, the, the live video, the nine hours live video. Oh yeah, yeah, the boot camp, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the boot camp, and that's that's really amazing. You know, I think oh, thank you. this is why I'm passionate about you know meeting awesome people like you because you're inside. If it can light me up, then it can light everyone else, right? Yeah, well, I and hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Everything changes with the thought. Yes. You know, once you know, oh, that's how you open the key. Then yeah. like that's how you open the door. Then you open the door the right way. You know, rather than trying to bang your head. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and that's what we did. That's what we do for so long in our lives is we were trying to bang our head on the door to open it instead of just turning the friggin' knob. Yeah, yeah I, I know. I definitely, I know. Believe me. And, uh, so, so the, the phrase is, you know, rather than being being a knob, you know, just open the knob. That's it. Yes, don't be a knob. Yes, do not be a knob. <laughs> In America, being a knob is a derogatory thing. I don't know if you know that. Like, if, yeah, so, yeah, okay, yeah. So, yeah, don't be a knob. Turn the turn the knob. Turn the knob. Don't be the knob. There you go. That's the. That's it. That's a book. Write a whole book on that. Oh, that's amazing. But uh, what I love is that with every every successful people, every lovely being that I've met, that I interviewed, I always ask. Them, what is your deepest pain? Because I believe that your deepest pain is your greatest gift. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, are you asking me? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. My my deepest pain is when I forget that I'm enough. My deepest pain is when is when I think that there's some part of me that's not complete, and that somebody or something outside of me is going to make me complete. Uh, that it can make me more complete or less complete. And, and it's, so it's, it's believing that that's true. Uh, so when I remember that it's not true, when I remember, cause I'm, I'm even wearing this shirt right now. I don't know if you can see it here. You don't have to believe everything you think, right? So when, yes. when I believe the thought that my enoughness can be changed by somebody else, I, I am in a lot of pain, a lot of pain. But when I remember that my enoughness cannot be dictated or increased or decreased by somebody else, then I'm free. So yeah, my greatest pain is my greatest gift because I know what that feels like and I'm not above it. And so I still feel that. And so I can relate to other people who still feel that too. But everyone, everyone yeah. has this pain, right? Yeah. Pain. Yeah. Even though they don't die. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nobody, especially people in personal development, people that are coaches and, and speakers, they want to act like they got it all together. People that are in personal development are usually the ones that are the most screwed up out of anybody. <laughs> So, so don't, don't, if anybody tells you they have it all figured out, they're lying, run away as quickly as possible. I agree with you. Yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> like, I know nothing. <laughs> yes, exactly. I know everything and I know nothing. <sighs> uh, but first of all, I, I feel like, you know, if we do this video, I should introduce like, you know, the amazing work that you do. And, you know, this is what you created. You wrote a book called uh, prison break yes what i love you know, let's you know to get away from that victim mentality and i actually watched your video uh when donald trump was elected as a president and then you said like oh you know a lot of people ask me to do the video but i don't want to do it because you know why should one person in the office change your whole life and i, I love that because yeah. you know you have to take your 
your responsibility, you know. I love what Steve Chandler, I think, was said that, you know, if there is a problem, you are the problem. Yeah, yeah. If there's a problem, I'm the problem. And if I'm the problem, I'm the solution. And, and I even, I, I modify that now. So, so I, I love what he says. If, I, if there's a problem, I'm the problem. Because if I'm the problem, I'm the solution. And, and I've tweaked that a little bit just to say, if, if there's a problem, my thinking is the problem. And if my thinking is the problem, then my thinking is the solution. Because I don't want I don't want it to be. Because I think sometimes people hear that and they say, "Oh, I'm the problem. Oh, now I have to beat myself up. Why am I so stupid? Why you know why am I doing this to myself?" And it's not about that. Like the prison break thing is not about finding fault with yourself for doing it wrong. It's about a level of freedom to say the only reason I'm experiencing this is because I have some thought in my head that may not even be my thought. Like I wake up in the morning and thoughts are just there. I don't say. Hey, brain, start. Like, they're just there. And it's only when I, I believe those thoughts just because they're in my head without questioning them or saying, well, what's, what's really going on? Is this a call for something? Is something trying to emerge? Am I, am I in a low state of mind? Did I not get enough rest? Am I not being gentle enough on myself? Like, when I don't go through that and I just believe whatever thought pops in my head, then yeah, that's going to be a problem. But that's so freeing because if I just start questioning those, those thoughts and I don't believe them immediately, well, then the solution is right there in front of me. It's amazing, isn't it? Like Michael Neal draw the metaphors about, you know, we all drawing this monster in our head. Yes. <laughs> yes. And then sometimes the monster that we draw, it's not even like you said, it's not even our voice. It would be like our parents or our society or our neighbors, you know, or our boss, you know, yeah. like those are the monsters that sort of got drawn by the imagination that we created and to question everything that we think. I think that's, that's amazing. You know, yeah. that everyone has to have the tenacity to be like, okay, you know, where is this come from? Is this my truth or not? Yeah. And if it's not, then there you go, right? Yep. You nailed it. You nailed it. Exactly. <laughs> I love that. It's And it's so much fun when you can do that. Like, I love that you're always laughing because if you're always laughing, then you'll always come up with the solution you need. You know, <laughs> a, a, a somebody who's laughing, nobody that's laughing ever has any problems, at least not in that moment. Like they have no, you've never seen anybody cracking up going, ha, 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 I don't know how to pay my mortgage. <laughs> my wife's going to leave me. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Right. If we're laughing, we're in a high spirit. We can find solutions to everything. Yeah. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That was probably my quickest way to get into like a high state is by laughing. <laughs> yeah, totally. What about, what about talk about state i think the importance of state is something that a lot of people are not aware of yeah you know that's why they get stuck in it right yeah. when people are angry they get stuck in being angry because they don't know how to change the state right even for me you know i, I go through that period of, oh my goodness you know the power of the state you know like, yeah if you can just like elevate it yeah and go from like zero to that uh from like low state to high state and obviously the better you are, the more aware you are, the quicker the, the time, you know, sometimes maybe it takes, you know, 10 hours for the anger to dissipate. Some people's like a year to dissipate. Yeah, yeah. What, what about you, Jason? What's your nugget of wisdom in terms of, you know, changing your state? Yeah. And I'm curious about how quickly for you to, to break the state. You know? Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so for me now, I'd say the majority of the time, it's, it's, it's almost instant that I can change my, change my state. But there are still certain things that happen, and I, I just did a Facebook Live today about a, a really difficult conversation I had to have with somebody who's very close to me, and the time leading up to that conversation, which was, you know, that was probably a, a day or two in the making where I was like, oh my God, I really got to have this conversation. Like, this, this relationship's not working out. This friendship's not working out. I'm not feeling valued. Like, that time leading up to that conversation, I, I could not break the state. I tried every tool. I byron katie myself. And I meditated and I fucking, you know, did, oh, sorry, I cursed. I don't know if I can curse or not. I, I, okay, okay. okay. I, I did, you know, I did, I, I tried to use every tool that I could. And what I was trying to do was, was going directly against one of the things I teach, right? Which is, this is why I love this work because like when I, when I'm on stage and I'm talking to an audience of, of 500 or a thousand people and I'm talking about these things that we're talking about now, I tell them all like, I'm not a guru. Like anything that's I'm talking to you about right now, I'm still practicing this moment by moment. I have not figured it out, right? So don't come up to me afterwards and say, oh, how do I be like you, enlightened all the time? I'm like, what are you talking about? Like I'm a human being, right? Stuff still gets me down. So what I was doing in that moment, uh, I love you too. Thank you. That's so sweet. <laughs> so, so, what, so what I was doing in that moment was I was trying to bypass my human experience and go directly to my tools. 
And, and one of my favorite quotes in the entire world is by Albert Einstein. And he says, you can't solve a problem with the same mind that created it. And so, so, when, so when I'm not able to change my state, it means I'm in such a low quality of thinking in the moment that no tool in the world is going to get me out of it. I don't care what tool it is. I don't care if Byron Katie sat next to me in that moment. If I'm not open and willing, open-hearted, open-minded, and willing to experience transformation, it's not going to happen. And so what I had to do in this particular situation I'm talking about with this difficult conversation was to say, oh, I feel like crap right now. This, this is – I'm kind of sad. Like, and you know what? And not only am I sad, I'm kind of pissed off that I can't get out of this right now. And that's okay. Like, that's okay. It's going to be okay. There's going to be a time in the not too distant future where this is all a memory or this is a great experience or this is a lesson or this is something that really hurt my heart that I can always remember. So I have contrast to share with my clients. So I know what it feels like and I can really be compassionate. Like I'll get to that place where it's all a gift and it's all happening for me, but not right now. Right in this moment, I just want to feel what I feel. And, and when I stop beating myself up for being the coach and the speaker and the author who wrote the book on this, and now I can't do it for myself in this moment, I'm a fraud, I'm a this, I'm a that, and I just remember, oh yeah, I'm a human, then that resistance starts lowering down. And then when I, I did that, and then when I did some Byron Katie work, I'm like, okay, I'm feeling freer. And then when I said, okay, I'm going to reach out to this person to have the conversation, I felt more confident. I felt more courageous. So it's just about really allowing myself to slow down, feel what I'm feeling, and allow loving that feeling to be my conduit to seeing opportunities to actually move forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I, I actually said to someone recently, that someone that's really upset about something and I said oh my goodness I know I shouldn't do this but I can't stop being upset right <laughs> even even and then I said to her look when there is a feeling you have to really feel it yeah. you know and let it let it go through your body like you know it has to go full circle otherwise if you repress it I said you have to let it out before you can let it go yeah it's true so and then even that feeling of grief you know it's like it's when I said to people even though they said you know why are you so happy all the time but I still feel sad and I give myself the time to be sad. I give yeah. myself time to, to grieve. I give myself time, you know, for you if it's you to be upset, whatever it is. Yeah. Because we have, we're still human, like, like yes. you said, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're just, you're numbing your experience of the world, and it's it, it's exactly. it's and it's kind of impossible. I've never seen it work where you can numb the negative emotions and not also yeah. numb the positive emotions. Like you numb one, you numb all, right? So either you numb yeah. if you numb one thing, you're going to numb everything. So don't numb anything. Experience everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's. Thank you for sharing that with me, though, because that's it's it's nice for people to like, like you said, for people to hear that. Oh, you know, we still struggle with with our emotions because sometimes it will just come. You know, the, the fact that you know, people. When I said to people that you know, don't be attached to your feeling, that they they think that I'm telling them to be detached for their feeling, mm. but that's not that's not what I meant. You yeah. know, because some people they hold on to like an anger as if you know this is something that. I actually have, have noticed this. I wonder what you think about this, right? A lot of us quantify love with mm-hmm. pain. Mm-hmm. You know, it's easier when someone loses someone that they love that they hold on into that, that pain because it means that they love them. Mm. Yeah. Other than, because if I ask someone, okay, you know, feel the love that is in your heart, people are like, they don't know that feeling. They're yeah. not familiar. But if I said, you know, feel the pain that is in your heart by losing that person. They go there straight away. Yeah. They know how to quantify it. Yeah. So this is a bizarre, you know, because I, when I go through cancer, I lost a lot of friends, and you know the family, the family as well. You know, it's, it's a struggle because you know I lost nine friends in a year. That's mm. a lot. Yeah. You know, I've never been to at that many funeral in my life. You know, mm. and and then my friends are like, stop going to the hospital and make friends. <laughs> <laughs> They're just trying to help you with more effective strategies for friendship, right? Oh, God. God love them. They're trying their best, right? <sighs> I got to help myself. But, you know, grief is not easy. No. You know, when we talk about grief, you know, it's, it's not easy. And, you know, I wonder, because of cu- culturally as well, you know, I think a lot of people say that, you know, if you feel someone, this is how you should feel. You know, you feel that pain. But even though it's some other culture, there are culture where they celebrate, you know, yeah. someone who passed away, you know, yeah. and you you, should, you shouldn't be you shouldn't feel sad, you, know, you should feel happy about it. Yeah. But I just find it fascinating about how we quantify that feeling of love. Yeah. With pain. 
Yeah. Yeah. That, it's yeah. So, it's so, it's so interesting. Yeah. You're right. Cause people do, they feel the pain so much easier than they, than they feel the love. And it, it's a weird thing. It's like, it's, it's all the ego talking, right? Like that, the person that's gone, they're not thinking about you. They're not here anymore. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're, <laughs> they're gone. And so you like, you know, you're wasting your energy. We think, we think that it, and this is not just for people that pass away, but even people that we, you know, we care about our, our, our parents, our children, our, our significant other. We think that if we worry, then it shows we love them. But the people who we, you know, worry about don't want us to worry. So if we really love them, if we really love them and want them to be happy, why are we doing the thing they don't want us to do? They want us to be happy. We want them to be happy. They want us to be happy. And instead we just suffer. Like it's, it's, it's backwards. It's totally backwards. And it's still a very natural thing to experience. You know, you love somebody and you think by worrying about them, it shows you love them, but it doesn't really happen. And the same thing with somebody passes. Like I think sometimes we think if we were to celebrate somebody who's passed, then it means we didn't care enough about them because we should mourn, right? We should be in a, a grief stricken place. But like you said, in some cultures, I was just in Mexico last month and it was during the, you know, the Dia de los Muertos where you actually celebrate the dead and they were having parties and they were playing music and just like, it was amazing. It's like, if there is a chance that somebody that's passed on the other side is watching us, I'd much rather they see me happy and having a party than sad and crying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But then again, you know, it's it's how do we quantify, you know, yeah. like how do we quantify love, you yeah, know? Yeah. And if if only we we have a culture where, you know, we, we do love, you know, we experience love more, yeah. then I think it will be easier for people to do that. Yeah. Don't you do you think? Yeah, so so how would you how would you solve the problem of people not experiencing enough love? I'm curious. You have to give them. <laughs> you have to them. yeah, you have to go first. Show them. Yeah. 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 Because they don't know, like, how could you, how could you teach, it's like teaching a baby how to walk, you know, how do you teach them? Yeah. Right, they see, you yeah. know, they observe, and then you give them the encouragement, yep. you know, and if they fall, and they fall, and then they learn. Yeah. Right? I love that. But you have, you have to, you have to be the one that show them how it's done. Yeah. And then they'll see it often, you know, they'll see it again, and again, and again, and, you know, it's not like a baby gonna see you walk one time, and it's like, oh! Yes. Right. I got it. I nailed it. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. That would never happen. You're right. No, you're right. You're so right. You're so right. You know? Yeah. And uh, that's why my principle is that, you know, now that I've been given extra time to live, you know, I have a mission to make this world a happier place because like you said, you know, happy people, they don't hurt each other. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's your mission. I mean, I think that that's, I think that's, that, that's one of the most noble missions, if not the most noble mission on the planet, right? Is if people are happy, everything else just kind of works. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's your mission as well. You know? I'm, <laughs> I'm with you. I am on the crusade with you. We are together <laughs> on this path. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So, I'm just, you know, it's, it's really something, you know, I always say that, you know, people are happiest when they have the freedom to be who they are. Mm. You know, that's, that's, my, that's what I believe. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, real self-expression, real truth, really being who you are. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah. So that's just, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we put on in love. And I love that your your story about, you know, your deepest pain is that feeling of I am not big, I am not enough. Yeah, yeah. Because when you, and everyone experiences that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's always it's always a call for something else. It's, it never has anything to do with enoughness. Because it's anytime, anytime I feel like I'm not enough and, and, I, and I ask myself, well, then what do, I, what do I need in this moment? What do I think I need in this moment? And maybe it's I need this person to tell me I'm enough. I need this person to validate me so I feel like I'm enough. Even slowing that down more is that I just want me to tell me that I'm enough, right? So it's like even when I think it's based on somebody external, it's always just something I want to hear from myself. It's never a conversation I need to have with somebody else. It's always a conversation I need to have with myself. And so it's asking yeah. in that moment, like, how can I, how can I really show myself? How can I really feel that I'm enough? And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. You know, you can look in the mirror and, and say that I love you and, and, and I cherish you and I'm grateful for you. And just, you know, say that over and over. You can meditate, you can, you know, you can, you can have affirmations, you can list all the things that you love about yourself. I mean, there's all these things you can do, but at the very core, it's knowing that even without any of that stuff, just by you being on the planet, you have this immense level of worthiness that nobody can ever question. 
when when did that um uh, when that when did that divine light <laughs> shine in your oh, in your soul? <laughs> God, I, God, I don't I don't I don't know. That. Everyone always oh. that like oh wow you know because I had I had that experience that I I, I probably it will never ever ever happen again in my life. Yeah. I know I I shared I shared with people that I stopped smiling for two weeks, so I know how it feels to be in that low state, to be in that darkness. Yeah. And then just have that experience, that immense love that that comes. Not from anyone else, but you know, if if, if people believe in God, you know, it, it's you know, I feel that that presence. You know, if people believe in the universe, I feel that presence, and then to just feel that blanket of love, and then knowing that I don't have to be anyone, I don't have to do anything. Yeah. Who I am, where I am now, yeah, is enough. Yeah. And you know, I experienced that. That's why I said, like, wow, you know, everyone needs to experience what I experience because yeah, <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> It will be okay, you know, knowing that it doesn't matter. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be, you know, whoever it is that people are telling you to be. Just be yourself, and that's enough. So that's yeah. that's my moment. I um I always have goosebumps every time I tell the story uh-huh. because it's and people will think that I'm crazy, you know. But you know, I was I was <laughs> I was at my point where I was just like, you know, imagine not smiling for two weeks mm. in your darkest moment. I was you know curled up in a ball crying, and then. And then suddenly you feel that presence. Yeah. You feel that so much love. Yeah. How do you explain that? I can't explain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't think it's possible. I have, I have so much love. It's because I experienced it. And you ask me. Yeah. How can you how can you give someone how to love? You know the feeling of love. Yeah. Right. When they don't love. Yeah. So because I experienced it, I didn't ask for it. I experienced it, and then this is how. Yeah. You know, because I've been when I said to people, you know, I've been taught how to love by love itself. Yeah. You know. Without any any rules, without any conditions, without anything, you know, I didn't even ask for it, you know. Yeah. And that's what love is, you know. Love comes when you didn't even ask for it. Love comes when there is no rules. Love comes when, you know, you just be you. Yeah. And then, because I said to people, right, you know, this is why I said to people when they are angry, they feel like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not being myself. Mm. It's because, at the core of it, you know, who we are is love. Yeah. Right. That's why they're not being themselves because they they're removing themselves from the core. Yeah. There is love. Yeah. And that's always been like my principle. You know, if people can just like go back in there, you know, feel yeah. that love that you have in your heart, and everyone has love. It's just that because of the noises that they have outside, they can't hear it. Yeah. Yeah. They can't feel it. Yep. You know. It's so true. So. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> so that's um that's why like whenever I'm below. By remembering that experience, right? Yeah. When you go back there. So I'm just curious about you. Obviously, everyone has these like fascinating stories that they come up with. Like, wow, you know, that's that's how I feel, and that's how that's gonna be my guide for the rest of my life. Yeah. Because you experience that. Yeah. So what's what's your experience? So experience? so 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 help me out. So my experience where I really felt that I was enough, or that I felt like I was yeah. like when I felt was I was enough. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. I guess I just gotta figure out. Pick which day of the week. Uh, I, I, cause I mean, it's, it's, a, it's work. It's work that I do on a regular basis is, is remembering so that I'm not, enough. Yeah. For you, it's not something that like one, like, like Bob Norman is, it's a continuous, you know, yeah. continuous voice that just keep like, you know, guiding you into, into yeah. feeling. Like well, yeah. And for me, it's, you know, I tend to, and this is, this is still kind of external, but, but, but I'm okay with it just because of the way it shows up is that the times that I, the times that I feel the most enough without me having to sit and meditate and remember it and think about it is when I'm being of service to others, right? Like when I'm, when I'm, when I'm really contributing to the world and this could be a five minute conversation with somebody where they leave with a little more joy than they came in with, or it can be an hour long keynote, or it can be me coaching somebody like whatever, or people giving me some kind of feedback about the book. Anytime I feel like I'm really being of contribution to the planet and to the world, uh, and to people's to people's consciousness in whatever way that is like I, I don't I'm not taking credit for it but when I feel like I have contributed something that immediately puts me in a place of like there there's a reason I'm on the earth and that's still external but it's one that I'm okay with like I I you know it's not it's not necessarily validation I guess in a sense it is um, but I just love knowing that there's something I'm doing that's contributing to the world but at the same time that's not enough right that can't be it because like what if what if you're sick for a month and you can't go out there and contribute to the, to the world? Does that mean you're just not enough for that entire month? So it's about like really slowing down and, and, and being, 
being truthful, seeing the reality of just how valuable I am to the world, right? Even if I'm laying in a bed sick, uh, I, I, I've provided so much value in the past. I will provide so much value in the future and I'm providing some type of value in that moment. It could be that there's somebody taking care of me and I'm providing value to them by giving them somebody to contribute to. Uh, it could be any number of things, but really just knowing my intrinsic value, even when I'm laying in bed sick, uh, that's, that's the kind of thing that I, I have to practice on a regular basis. Can I can I share something? With yes, you? please. Yeah. <laughs> because when you said yeah, even when I'm sick for a month, I was sick for a long month. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> and, then, and then what I did is that uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I I make a video diary every single day. Oh, I didn't know I that. Promised to myself, I promised myself that I'm gonna smile every single day, even if it's just once. Love that. So every day I make a video diary, even when I was in ICU. <laughs> What, and how did it feel? Like, did it change your state to be smiling? Like, did it change things for you to smile? Of course, because, yeah. you know, my intention when, when I started, when I was diagnosed, I don't know how, how long I, I'm going to have my um, time in the, in the, <laughs> to live, right? So I said, okay, you know, this is what I'm going to do because my, my drive to contribute like you, like you to yeah. contribute to make this world a better place is always so strong because I've been in that place where mm. I was, in a way, rejected in a way, you know, not feeling that loneliness, feeling that, um, feeling that desperate times, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I said to myself, man, you know, if someone who is so, as positive as me can go down that low, what about those who are out? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why, like, suicide is something that is close to me because everyone can go there. Oh, yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you're at. Everyone can go there. Yeah. And that's why that's, that drive is, like, always so strong to me. Yeah. So <laughs> when I was so sick, when you have that drive, like you have this immense drive mm. to contribute for others. And I would love to like talk to you and dig deeper like where that come from. Because sure. when you realize where that come from, then like there's just no way again, no, nothing can stand in your way to like keep serving. And yeah. <laughs> this is why I share with you. Even when you were sick for a month, you know, I did this video diary every single day. Knowing that, you know, if I were to pass, then I have already left something behind. Yeah, I love that. And it, it changed my life because it, it actually I ended up on the news because I've become this someone. Uh, yeah, everyone is like, you know, I bring a lot of positivity into a cancer hospital. You that's know? amazing. And that's quite amazing. You know, that's quite amazing. And I, I, if I look back into it, you know, like I said, you know, I didn't ask for it. I didn't. I didn't try to like, oh, you know, and this is what I have to do. But it just come from that place of serving. It came from that place of love. Yeah. You know, and this is why love can do great things. Yeah, it really you can. Know? It really, really can. And, <laughs> and, it, and it, yeah, it's, it, and it's hard too because like it should be easy enough to just say that anything where you're trying to figure out, like when you're trying to, when you're questioning your enoughness, it should be easy enough to say that's just the ego, just detach from it. And maybe sometimes that works well enough, but not always. Sometimes you need to do something to prove to yourself that you are a valuable person. And so I think contribution and service is a great way to do that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so even when you're sick for a month, you still can do something. Yes. And all I did is just doing like two minutes video, you know, just, just sharing. That's sharing awesome. And that's why I think when people can see it doesn't matter what you go through in life. When I can show them that there is still something to, to smile about, mm. then people are gonna like, oh, you know, my day is not so bad. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I love that. I love that. You know? but, yeah. That's why when people ask, you know, how are you? No, I'm alive. I'm happy. <laughs> mm. Yes, and you're and you say and right and that's it. Like you're you're happy because you're alive. Like it's like not and nothing else has to happen. Nothing else has to go well. Like you can be happy just because you're alive. I love that. And I, I, I posted this the other day. I, I asked people, you know, what is your rule for happiness? You know, some people, the rules is like a lot. You know, like yeah. You have a car, you have to have a relationship. You know, like yeah, yeah. The rule is so much. And I said, maybe I'm happy because my rule of happiness is simple. I'm breathing. I'm happy. And, and I can't argue with that one. That's happening. That, and that we all, ha we all have that one. That's, we're all in common. That's so good. I love that. I'm, you're breathing. Your rules. <laughs> yeah, seriously, stop making it so complicated. 
I have to I have to live in this part of town. I have to have this kind of spouse. I have to have this kind of kid. I have to have this much money in the bank. It's like, God, you know, it, it's always funny to me that we think, and again, I say we because me too, but we think that the path to something that's that's high spirited somehow has to come from a place that's low spirited. Like if my if my goal is to be happy, then I need to like force myself to do things that I hate doing in order to be happy. Like why would the path to happiness include despair? Like the path to happiness, just start with being happy. Just, yeah. Like start with where you want to be. Like don't feel like you have to go through drudgery to get to happiness. Just cut out the middleman. Choose happy now. Yeah, but don't you don't you believe that it's because of what the society yeah. has imprinted? Oh yeah. You know this is this is how this is how it works. Yeah. And then you know you have a lot of people in their mid late thirties saying that you know I've done all the things that society wants me to do. I'm not happy, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and we have these, we have the conditioning, and we have the expectations, and it's, you know, it's so funny. Like, I, I wonder sometimes if, if they didn't have, so like they have, you know, commercials for restaurants, right? And in a commercial for a restaurant, at, you know, at, let's say a big chain restaurant or something, and in the commercial, the family walks in and they're all happy, and literally, like three seconds later, they're sitting at a table, and literally three seconds later, they're all eating and they're happy and they're all having fun. And, and so all this ha- their entire experience happens in the course of 15 seconds. I really wonder if those commercials didn't exist, if people would stop being so angry when they had to wait for a table or their food was taking 20 minutes to come out because they have this expectation in their head. Oh, well, that's how it's going to be when I go to Red Lobster. I'm going to walk in. They're going to seat me. My food's going to be ready for me as soon as I sit down. But if they didn't know that, they may sit there and go, I, I only have to wait 10 minutes to sit down and be served. I only have to wait 15 minutes for somebody to cook a meal for me by hand and bring it to my table. Like our, our expectations are all screwy. It's all screwy. So if we drop those expectations, everything that we think, everything that we complain about can be just a thing that we're, we're grateful for. And it's perfect the way it's happening. How long did it take you to come into that realization? <laughs> 30, 30 years. I'm not kidding. 30 years. The first 30 years. Yeah. Of, well, maybe not from zero to seven or eight years old. But, you know, from that time on, uh, you know, the better part of 30 years, it took me to do that. And now the only difference is now is that I have awareness of what's actually causing my suffering when I'm suffering. It doesn't mean I don't suffer anymore. It just means I'm aware of where my suffering is coming from and I have the awareness and the tools to change that experience if I want to or to allow the experience to continue if I want to. But it's no longer something outside of me that I'm just, you know, flailing in the wind and I have no control and I'm, you know, it's like a hurricane and I have to grab onto the lamp and it's going to pull me away. Like it's not outside of me anymore. I know that it comes from inside me. That's the only difference. Yeah. Isn't that amazing though? This is the thing, right? Because when you said that, oh, you know what? Do people drag themselves to do the work that they don't love to get the thing that they love? Yeah. And if you can drop that, then you, you're here. Yeah. But people have this attachment to money. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And now that you are where you are now, right? Yeah. Would you share a little bit about how, how did you get there? You know, how did you get to do the things that you love? And, yeah. you know, be, be rewarded by it as well. And, you know, yeah. because I think a lot of people want to know, I want to do the things that I'm passionate for, you know, yeah. but they didn't realize the hard work that you've done. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. It's, it's not, it's not easy. It's not, it's not all, you know, it's, it's not all glamorous. And, and so that, you know, my stance is I don't necessarily believe in, in do what you love. I, I believe in love what you do. Right. And so, yeah. so when I say yeah. like the path to happiness shouldn't include things you hate doing, it's not the things, it's you, <laughs> you know, it's, it's what, so, so if whatever needs to be done for you to be happy, you can bring happiness to that thing, right? So it's not about like, you know, and that's the thing in the entrepreneurship culture, which I don't really love is there's a lot of, and I just saw this, I, I'm, I'm in a group program right now and, and I, I won't talk about specifics, but I'm in a program right now and I saw somebody say like, tomorrow I'm going in and I'm giving two weeks notice of my job and I'm done and I'm leaving and I'm going off on my own and that's beautiful. Like I'm super excited for them to do that and, and I have no idea about their financial situation. Maybe they have a year of savings in the bank so it's okay to leave now. But it, it reminded me of this, this notion in entrepreneurship 
go all in. Like if you're passionate enough, you'll figure it out and mortgage your house and max out your credit cards. And, and it's one thing to leverage your resources to build your business. It's another thing to rely on your resources to build your business and kind of then become a prisoner to whatever you're building. So, so for me, it's like, if I know that I can work in a job that I don't love for an extra six months and that allows me to save up money so that I don't have financial pressure when I go off on my own and try to do something, I am going to find ways to fall in like, I don't need to fall in love, to fall in like with the thing I'm doing because that thing is is the financier of my dreams. It's not this horrible job with this horrible boss and I hate my life and I don't want to do this because I'm not passionate about it. Like th- That's a very prisoner way to look at it. This thing is serving you in some way. And if you can get out of your own way and see how it's serving you, you can love the thing you're doing, even if it's not exactly what you want to be doing long term. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. Because so for, then if, yeah. you, if, if you stop doing what you do now, then you're putting yourself in a financial pressure. Yes. And then that's going to take you in the in an even lower state. <laughs> yeah, it just spirals down. And then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's all about. I love uh, Gary Vaynerchuk always say about you know self awareness. Yeah, you know? and he's you know the more you know how things work, the more you know how you work, the more you know like everything. You know, yeah, the better you will be at it, and to have that consciousness to okay, you know what is the right thing for you to do right now. Yeah, and it's not about going blind like you know when you said that going blind in in going all in without knowing okay you know what is the implication for yes. it all. Right, because you, you, you obviously, you know, you chase, you know, you have this really strong vision in terms of what you want to create in the world, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of people have to have that, but a lot of them, you know, they they holding the vision for someone else. <laughs> yeah, right, and and that's okay, and that's okay too, right? Because that gives you experience in holding a vision, right? So like it's, yeah. it it all serves you. So if you can hold a vision for somebody else, then that's experience you have now to hold a vision for yourself. And it's, you know, I, I worked, I worked in it for, you know, almost 15 years and my last, seven years. yeah, did you? Yeah. yeah. And in my last, and my last seven years, I was in one company for the last, the last seven years of my corporate job. And, and, it, and it was good in the beginning. And then it got to be so high level of stress. And, and, and it's when I was kind of at my lowest personally and, and, but my highest professionally. And, and, and it was, it was something where, I I knew I wanted to be doing something different, but I also knew that I would have a lot better chance of succeeding if I was able to approach the job that I was in from a place of creativity and say, how can I use all the things that I think I hate about this job? How can I use these things as, as, as a trigger to cultivate something about myself that I can use to deal with this job, but that will also serve me when I start my own business? Right, like how can every bit of stress in this company be a gift for me as I'm getting ready to move on? And so, and, and so I tried to do that to the best of my abilities and I saved up money and I left my corporate job and I went all into being an entrepreneur. This is before I did coaching or speaking. This is more traditional, a traditional company that I started. And, and after that company failed and I, I lost all the money that I had in that business with my partners, I had to go back to work again. I had to go back and get a corporate job again, which was like... I don't want to do that. I, I, I left that. I don't, I, that, the point was to get away from that, not to just do it for a year and go back. But I had to realize, like, listen, if I'm really going to do what I want to do, if I'm going to make an impact in the world and that requires me to have some kind of financial backing, then how freaking beautiful and wonderful is it that I was able to go back and get a job in corporate again to save money again? And so I did that and I worked for another six months in an, another corporate job that just the people were very angry and, and, and very like snippy and it was very high demand and it was IT again. And when that six months was over, I left again and I haven't been back since. And that's been, you know, three and a half, four years. But but like you have to be willing to do whatever needs to be done and like I said, to fall in like with that process, to not think that the process should be different than it is because that's where all that suffering and that, that despair is going to come from. I like to modify fall in like with fall in light. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, because fall in love is like that's a that's big. Fall in love is big. I tell people fall in love with your job. They're like, eh, you don't know my job. But anybody, you but you can you can you can fall in like with anything. You know, I can fall in like with Brussels sprouts if I have to. You know. Yeah. That's amazing. You're not playing game, Jason. I always. That's the, the the answer to that question is always yes. So you know everything has to be like. Because everything, if it's to make it a unique experience, it has to be 
something that you have never done before, right? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. If, if this conversation is about something that you've never, never, it's a conversation that never been created before. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> right. So, what is what is the one thing? This is rich, rich games, you know. What's what's the one thing that you don't want me to know about you that you've never said to anyone before, else before? Ooh. What's the one thing that I don't want you to know about me that I've never told anybody else before? Well, I mean, so I guess this is like super recent, so I, I haven't told anybody because it hasn't made sense. And, and I probably wouldn't. But like, as much as I love being with you right now, I'm very tired, right? I've been traveling a lot and, I, and, I, and I'm here, I'm, I'm here visiting some family and I'm doing some work stuff, but I'm also visiting family and I have my 95 year old grandmother here that I came to visit who's not, who's not doing so well. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm here and I'm talking to you and I'm having fun, but a little part of my head is thinking about like, I may have seen my grandmother today for the very last time. And, okay. and, and it's thinking about like, you know, how much I love her and how much I'm so thankful that I got to see her one more time because I wasn't sure she'd, she'd stick around long enough for me to fly down here and see her. And, and, and so like just putting all that energy into all the people that I've been seeing and, and, and being with today and, and, you know, this is the being with you now is the fourth, you know, interaction like this that I've had today. And so like, oh, wow. I, I'm so committed to being here with you and being present and having fun. And there's a part of me that's really tired and wants to take a nap yeah. and, and wants to just like love my Grammy. So, so that's, yeah. that's what's going on right now. Wow. Thank you so much for like giving the time, you know, and sharing that with me. Yeah. My um, pleasure. I will let you go. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. But I mean, and at the same, like I'm tired at the same time you energize me. So I'm like, I'm in this, my body's saying, go to sleep. My mind saying, shut up. This is fun. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's almost five o'clock. I've been up since like five a.m. and last night I didn't go to bed till late. But it, it's okay. It's all it's all wonderful. It's all beautiful. Yeah, yeah. You can have a nap after this. <laughs> no, I, I have another meeting after this. Oh, really? <laughs> one more. One more. Do it. Oh, I'll take it. Let it rain <laughs> over me. I feel it. I feel it. And, and I'll, I'll hydrate too. Hydration's important. I'll hydrate. Can we, um, just before you leave, because um, obviously um, you share something which is really special with me, which is your great grandmother. And yeah. I can see that you love her very much. Oh, yeah. And have you lost uh, someone in your life that's really special to you? Because you no, yeah. So I, I think the first, the first person actually would be my grandfather. So her, her husband, he died. Uh, gosh, maybe five, six years ago now, um, and he lived a long life. He was ninety three years old, I think. Uh, lived yeah. a very, very long life. But I didn't have a father my entire life. My mother raised me as a single mother, and I'm an only child. So my grandfather was one of two male role models I had in my life. I had my grandfather and then I had my, my uncle who's my mom's, my mom has a twin brother. Um, so my, my, yeah, so my uncle and my grandfather are like the two men, the only two men I've really had in my life, my entire life. And my grandfather was, he's such a, he was such a sweetheart. Uh, he wasn't like a real outwardly loving person. Like you would say, I love you, Papa. And he would say, yeah, me too. Like he wouldn't, he wouldn't say, oh, I love you too, Jason. Come give me a hug. He was very, yeah, me too. But that was his way and you felt it. Like you felt that that meant like, I love you so much and I cherish you and I'm so happy that we're family. He meant that, but that's not what he said. So, so I was just so close to him and like, I didn't like sports at all, but I would hang out with him and he would watch sports and I would just sit there and watch it with him. And I pretend that I knew it was going on and I'm like, yeah, go, go green team. Like I had no idea what was going on, but, but just like having that connection with him. So so when he passed, it was really, it was really tough for me. It, it was more, it was actually less, him passing actually wasn't nearly as tough as watching him decline into passing. The passing to me was a relief. I was happy for him when he passed. Um, but, but leading up to the passing, it was very, it was rough because you, you, you realize your own mortality and you realize that, you know, right now I'm in this healthy body. I'm fairly young. Uh, you know, my, everything works. I can go and, you know, do whatever. I don't have any, any, any limitations to live a normal life and to do things that I want to do. But at some point the body and the mind deteriorate 
And, and so it was really a great lesson for me to say, um, you know, I'm not always going to have what I have available to me. So if I'm not using it to its fullest potential to make an impact, uh, I'm going to regret that later on. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to thank you for, for sharing that. And it's, it's amazing how someone's life changed your life. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. And you know, now that, you know, your name is sort of, I think like grief is, I would love to talk to you more if we have time about, about grief and how, how to best handle grief because it's everyone experiencing it. Um, and for you, obviously, you, you mentioned before that, oh, you know, if the, those person wants to be happy, you know, rather than you worrying about them. But how do you, you know, like, how do you teach that, you know, to, to people to, like, embrace grief in a, in a, in a different way? Yeah. Because the emotion is intense, you know, especially if someone that's, that's close to you. I lost my dad uh, four years ago. Mm. And I don't know, I, and the same when you lost your uh, grandfather, you know, mm. like this intense emotions, you've never felt it before. Yeah. And you don't know what death means until that happens to you. Like right. you hear about it, yep. but you don't know. And they're like, wow, you know, like and this emotion is just so intense. You know, you can't quantify it. You can't express it. It's just like, what is this? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. How do you deal with that like intense emotions right, with you when when that happens to you? Yeah. Uh, with when your grandfather passing. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not enlightened enough, you know. Like if you talk to somebody like Byron Katie, Byron Katie doesn't believe in grief. She she doesn't she just okay. she doesn't believe in it, and and she has her own reasons for that. But I'm I'm not that enlightened yet, so I I, I don't I can't say like oh I would not feel sad at all. I, I wouldn't feel grief at all. I'm not at that point. I would feel sadness. I would feel grief. So I think it's, there's this really fine line and it's different for every single person between feeling what you need to feel versus allowing yourself to get stuck in that feeling, yeah. right? Yeah. And nobody yeah. can tell you when you're crossing that line. It's impossible. Yeah. Nobody can tell you. People can, can guess, they can think, they can say, oh, you've, you've been grieving too long or you didn't grieve long enough. Everybody can have their own expectations. But, but, but we have to be enough in touch with ourselves to say, is this something I'm feeling um, because, because I truly just need to feel it? Or is it something I'm relying on that, I don't, that, I'm, ho that I'm attaching to, that I'm, that I'm holding on to because I think I need it for some reason? Because if I let go of the grief, that means the person truly is gone. Or if I let go of the yeah. grief, that means I never cared about them or it's not going to look like I care about them enough. Yeah. And it's like right. that, that, so that you have to, you, me, everybody, we have to know what that is for ourselves. And I think that just comes from a level of awareness, just checking in and saying like, what am I feeling right now? Okay. I'm feeling really sad that person left and I'm thinking about the memories of them and, and I wish they were still here and it's not fair that they left so early or it's not fair that I didn't get to say goodbye. Like good, feel all that stuff. Don't, don't try to figure out a way to deal with it or bypass it. But then at some point ask yourself like, am I ready to transcend this? Am I ready to take, yeah. to take the memories that I have of them and put them in my heart and, and know that they're no more alive now than they were if they were in a different room of the house and I wasn't sure what room of the house they were in or I thought they were in another room of the house but actually they had left and gone to the grocery store. In my mind, they were alive and well but I had no idea what was going on. So I can, I can maybe get to that point where they're just as alive in my head and my heart as they ever were but that doesn't happen necessarily immediately. I, I don't know if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, 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 no, it does because like when my dad passed away, I have these like intense emotions, so I and then I finally realized that pain, when you transform that pain, you can transform into a feeling of darkness, right? right? Darkness being stuck and you know feeling that hurt, or you can transform this pain into something that's enlightening. Yeah. And you know, I think for the first time in my life, I really understand how you can transform this pain. That pain is an energy, and then if you use it. You know, so every time I, I miss my dad, every time I'm feeling that, you know, I transform this into, okay, you know, my dad has always been like this amazing person that helps others. So I, I was, when I miss them, when I miss him, I remember that, okay, you know, it's just my energy I need to transform to help others. Mm. So oh, I love there's, that. There's no, you know, it's, it, I, because I now, now I have the understanding, you know, that, you know, you can either make it into something that destroys you or something that grows you. And then if you borrow that, that love that you have in your heart with, for the person that you love, then it can transcend into the love that you have for others that mm. are still living and that is something that they want to do anyway. But ev like you said, everyone needs to have that awareness, you know, when is the time to transform this energy? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I love what you said, though. I think that's beautiful. I think I think embodying the energy of the best parts of the people we miss is one of the most yeah. beautiful ways to not only honor them, but to feel connected yeah. to them again. I think that that's what you said is, is gorgeous. It's so powerful. So thank you yeah. for sharing that. That was really, really cool. Uh, thank you. And uh, of course, you know, obviously you, you're going through this time as well. So yeah. it's just, when you said that you're not there yet, Myron Kelly doesn't believe in grief. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not there yet. She's got it down. I'm, I'm not there yet. Maybe one day, but for now I'll, I'll stick with my grief. But uh, I'm sure that Myron Kelly will, will say that, you know, you have to feel what you feel and then let it go, right? right. Because still, you know, even though I haven't, I'm yet to do uh, meet Myron Kelly, but she also still has this feeling, but she knows, you know, not to get attention yet. Right, right. She welcomes she it. She still feels sick. Yeah, she, she welcomes it. She goes, oh, yay, I'm feeling sad. This is so – and she really – mean. like she, she tells a story about her mother passing away and that her mother, her mother died on Christmas Day. And, and, and they, were, they were caring for her mother in her house. So she actually passed away inside the house on Christmas Day. And, they, and when they came to take her away, when, when the medical people came to take her away, they put a blue – like a blue blanket over her. Right to cover her body, and as by this is, I, and I'm live with her. I'm 20 feet away from Byron Katie. She's telling me the story, and she's laughing as she's saying it. Right, and she's like giggling, and she's like, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm telling this story." It's about her mom dying on Christmas, and she's laughing. Right, I'm like, "What? Why is she laughing?" And then, and she finally gets to the punchline. She goes, and then as they're wheeling her out with this blue thing on top of her, the radio is on, and the song "We'll Have a Blue Christmas Without You" by Elvis comes on, and she starts cracking up laughing that it was some message from her mom from the universe that she was draped in a blue, you know, blue cloth, and we're gonna have a blue Christmas, and she thinks it's hilarious, and it's like many people would look at her and say, "You're a fucking sociopath. What is wrong with you? Why are you laughing?" <laughs> But she gets, but she gets the perfection. She gets the humor. She gets the absurdity. Like, why would you look at all that and be sad when you could look at it and say, "Oh my God, this is so funny. Look at all these things that have lined up that honor this person that I love. That it's so fun yeah. that our last experience of her is this funny, ironic thing." Yeah. <laughs> Again, I don't know if I'm there yet, but I love that she told the story that way. What did, What is holding you into like not being dead? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't, I guess I've been blessed that I haven't had to really experience that kind of loss on a very regular basis. Um, I think if anything, if any, the, the only thing that I think ever holds me back is, is, a, is going too fast in my thinking, Right. So, so if at any given moment something happens and I get upset and it doesn't matter if it means I, I'm mad at somebody who cut me off in traffic or, or, or I'm upset because you know somebody dies, like whatever that is, the only reason I think I, get, I would get upset and not be in that place is because my mind goes too fast and says they shouldn't have cut me off or this person shouldn't have died or they should have been around longer or I should have had more time. Like when, I'm, when my thoughts are speeding like that, it's like the way I talk about it, it's like a snow globe. You shake up a snow globe right? And the snow is going everywhere. And all of a sudden you can't see shit, right? Like you're on the, you're on the inside looking out. You can't see anything. There's snow all in front of you. You can't even see your hand in front of your face, right? But if I just chill, instead of trying to take responsibility and like take every piece of snow and put it on the ground so I can see clearly again, if I just sit for a minute and slow down, the snow is going to settle on its own. I don't need to do anything. And then once the snow settles, I can say, okay, now that I can see clearly, What's really going on here? Like, how is this going to serve me? Uh, what do I, what, what, there's some part of me that needs something right now. What is that part? Is there a part of me that needs to be held and that needs to be heard and that needs to be loved and that needs to cry and that needs to feel pain? Is there a part of me that, that needs to be told it's going to be okay? Is there a part of me that just needs to be gentle and compassionate with myself? Like really checking in with myself and saying, you know, self, what do you need? Like, I'm here to give it to you. Just tell me what it is you need instead of me guessing and trying to figure it out on my own. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know you, you're very like fast. You know, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my brain goes very fast. And, and, and it's funny. I was just talking to somebody about this yesterday. You know, we were talking about kind of, you know, my, my, my brand, the way I show up in the world and not, not as a manufactured thing, but like the way I legitimately show up in the world. And I worry sometimes that my speed and my fastness and, and, and just the way I do things 
it's too much for people. Like it, it may turn them off because they can't handle it. And they, and, and the person told me, well, then I know what you should do. And I'm like, well, tell me, like, I, I feel like I know what they're going to say. They're going to say, well, just, you know, chill out. And they said, turn that shit up. Be, be the most you you can possibly be and if it's too much for somebody let them go away I'm like, That's it. <laughs> okay I can do that I can I can do it so I'm committed to showing up and being me and giving the people that really resonate with me and love me an even more clear reason to resonate with and love me and so I don't, I don't know why that even came up just now it seems totally unrelated but I, I just figured I'd share that it is related <laughs> because we going back into that that point of you know people are happiest when they have the freedom to be who they are yes. so you are showing up as who you are don't worry about the people that that are not running with you because they can just watch <laughs> that's right full circle we did it full circle <laughs> sometimes people even learn from watching yeah right yep so yep. Yep. it's okay you know yeah. you if you if that's how you speak then that's how you speak you know that you will invite people who like resonates with you like you said can't please everyone. That's right. <laughs> you know? That's right. And and try. Yeah. I'm crazy. That's okay. You know, the crazy ones having fun with me. <laughs> that's right. And they're right. I am crazy. They're absolutely right. They're not wrong. <laughs> so before we go, um, would you like to share a toolkit? You know, everyone always have this toolkit that right, and especially coaches, they have a lot of toolkits. What's your favorite uh, toolkits in terms of elevating your state from low to high? I think my favorite toolkit is my book. Uh, I think I honestly, like I, I, I really, like I read it, I read my own book and, and I, I, and it's so my wife did this too, which I love a couple of weeks ago when I was gone and she, she text messaged me and she goes, Hey, and I don't, I don't know how I should, how I should process this. She said, Hey, you know what? I almost forgot what a good writer you are. And I'm like, oh, screw you. Don't be forgetting what a good writer I am. But she's, I almost forgot what a good writer you are. And I was feeling a little down. And so I picked up your book and I was reading through the, the chapter titles and I found one that kind of looked like it may help me. And I read it and it totally helped me. And I, and I love that because even my wife gets the benefit from this, but, but it's not, it wasn't written for her and it wasn't written for you and it wasn't written for anybody else. Really. It was written for me. And, and I go back to it. I, there's one chapter in, in particular that I go back to a lot and it's chapter, I have the book here. Hold on. I think it's chapter nine, but I don't know. Hold on. Let me make sure. No, it's not chapter nine. I'm glad I, I checked. Chapter eight. Chapter eight is called your intuition is drunk. And, and it's my favorite chap. It's one of my favorite chapters in the book because it's the one that I seem to keep going back to for myself. And, and so it's a lot about what we're talking about here with your quality of mind, your quality of thinking, your level of consciousness. Um, so, so I mean, one of, so one of my favorite toolkits really is my book because I go back to it. I, I look at it all the time. Put the book, put the book oh. up again. Is it? All right. I'm going to tell everyone to like get that book because that book is amazing. Thank you so <laughs> much. Behind it is amazing as well. This is, see, look, this is how you're supposed to do it. See, with the glasses. So you, you poke your own eyes out. And, and, and what, I, what I'd love to do is, if, if this would serve your audience and you let me know, if not, we don't have to do it. But um, I, I'm, I'm happy to give uh, f, you know, some free electronic copies away to your audience and, and also uh, even a free paperback um, uh, for people in the U.S., um, I'll, I'll set up a special web page just for you and for your listeners. And if they want to go get a copy of Prison Break for free, so they don't have to go to Amazon and buy it or whatever, I'm happy to give that to you. As long as you don't share it, don't share it publicly. If it's just for you and your listeners, um, I'll do that, and I'll, I'll set up a, a link and I'll give you the link, and you can share it with your with your viewers and your listeners. That's amazing, Jason. I really appreciate it. I know My you're pleasure. tired, you know, but no, you're I'm, making this time. And I'm good. You know, you know, you know, woo 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 woo. <laughs> Raise the roof. Well, the, if the roof is higher, but raised. We got we got lights. We can do like a, a like a. Hold on. We can we can do we can do techno. Hold on a second. Oh, you're amazing. You're amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. I'm really hoping that you know next year I get to hug you in person. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. And for making the time, it's just, it's just amazing. Oh, it's my pleasure. And, and, yeah. I learned so much from you. It's just like your vulnerability um, in terms of feeling the feeling. And, you know, that's everyone that's feeling as well that, you know, we're still human and yeah. being vulnerable about that. And it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. And I think when you said, you know, I'm not there yet. When you said, you know, I'm not there yet. What was you not being there? And then you, you said to me, it's the thinking. 
thinking yeah. is too fast. Yeah. Right? That's it. And then if you let go of that thinking, you're there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, when, even, when, even when you said, I don't know. Yeah. And then, and then you realize that, okay, you know, the answer is actually the thinking. Yeah, it is. It's all, it seems to always be the thinking. And, and it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, and this has been wonderful, and I'm so honored that you invited me to, to do this with you. And the way you show up in the world is with so much joy and so much love and so much heart and, and just such a, a real commitment to spreading joy in the world. And, and that's something that touches my heart a lot, and I wish more people were doing it. But I won't wish for more people to do it because then that's an expectation. I will instead just be grateful that you are doing it. And please, <laughs> please, please continue doing it for the good of the planet. Yeah, I hope there will be more of this, Jason. Absolutely. We'll make it happen. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for your love, for your heart, for you, and for oh. the book. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. You're so welcome. Amazing. Enjoy it. All right. We'll talk All soon. Right. Love you. Mwah.